something that I call being a, a citizen hacker. And it's kind of a, a, a term I invented last night. Um, it's a play on um, uh, the term citizen scientist. And I, I kind of despise the term citizen scientist because it kind of implies that um, uh, people who are citizens can't be scientists. And it's usually used to refer to things like having school children go and do experiments. And it's kind of like you're being uh, this consolation prize version of a scientist because you're not an official scientist. You're just a citizen scientist. But in fact, you know, as soon as you start doing science, you're a scientist. And I'm an official scientist, so I get to say that. I, in fact, I get to declare who is a scientist, and that's everybody who practices science. But what I think about, when I think about a citizen hacker, I want to kind of invert that. We're all hackers. Everybody in this room uh, is a hacker. I mean, we're a little suspect for being in a room before noon. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're definitely hackers. But I want us to also think of ourselves uh, and the hacking that we do as being in the larger context of our responsibility as, as citizens, as you know, however you may define it. And what I'm going to talk about in this talk is the way I've defined that for myself and hopefully to encourage you to think about some of the same things and, and maybe join me or, or do something similar um, on your own. So a little bit about my background. Um, so in 1993, uh, I finished uh, my degree. I you know, finally did everything you could do with school. And I uh, landed at um, what I, I would have to say is the best job ever, uh, which was at uh, Bell Labs. And Bell Labs was a magical place, Bell Labs Research, in 1993 um, and that era. Because essentially it was the research arm of the telephone company. And uh, it's the telephone company basically didn't you know, had a lot of extra money because it was a big monopoly. And uh, a lot of the way it budgeted for things was based on, well, uh, we uh, budget a percentage of what our expenses are. So the higher our expenses, the more we can make. And so they said, well, let's build a big cost center. And they built a research lab with, um, you know, great people who were basically given the freedom to do um, what they wanted. Um, that unfortunate, and if I could go back to any job that I've ever had or could imagine, it would probably be, you know, 1993 at, at, at Bell Labs. Um, in 2004, after, uh, you know, AT&T kind of came to its senses about research, um, I joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania in the computer science department. Uh, and much to my surprise, that was about half the salary and twice the work and also uh, the best job ever. Um, it, was, it was one of the nice things about being a professor is you're officially defining your own destiny. And you nobody can really tell you what to to work on. And that's an amazing freedom and an amazing responsibility to have. Uh, and then in uh, January of this year, uh, 15 years after I, I became an academic again, um, I got the uh, another best job ever, but also one of the strangest jobs ever. Uh, Georgetown University, which is down the road in, in Washington, D.C., um, basically said, we want to give you a really weird job. Um, we want you to join our, our computer science department, and we also at the same time want you to be a law professor uh, in the law school. And uh, they uh, um, noticed that about half of my recent papers and publications have been in law reviews rather than just academic computer science-oriented uh, journals. And they wanted somebody who, in the law school, who could really speak to the detailed issues of technology and its larger impact on law and public policy and related things. So I managed to, you know, kind of hack my way into being a law professor without ever actually having gone to law school. Um, and, you know, and I mentioned to people, hey, I'm, you know, I'm joining uh, uh, Georgetown Law. And they said, oh, well, that, that's great. You know, let me give you some advice on your first year classes. And uh, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a law professor. And they said, oh, really? Um, that's uh, um, how do you pull that off? And I'm still wondering. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, so I'm now officially, um, I think my job is now um, citizen hacker. Um, I, I want to understand um, really um, as my day job uh, the larger impact of the work that I'm doing rather than as something that I have to kind of uh, hide from my uh, employer. Um, and so I'm going to give a, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some examples of this and then I'll do a deep dive into kind of a current uh, an ongoing uh, project that I think you should um, be thinking about your own, uh, devoting your own talents uh, to. So, uh, I, I, just a few highlights of of some citizen hacker work that I've done. In uh, 1994, uh, a, a year into my, uh, a little less than a year into my job at uh, uh, Bell Labs AT and T. Uh, the U.S. government, almost immediately after I started there, proposed a system uh, for encryption to replace the data encryption standard, which was the 56-bit uh, uh, secret key algorithm uh, that was uh, a standard for the U.S. government as well as the de facto standard for encryption used by, uh, in the private sector. And, you know, it was pretty widely recognized by then that DES was showing its age, 56 bits is not a big enough uh, key space uh, in practice. It would soon be vulnerable to exhaustive search. And so the people were clamoring for a stronger uh, secret key cipher algorithm. And at the same time, um, parts of the government, particularly law enforcement, although the uh, intelligence community probably um, carried most of the public water for it, but it was probably really driven by law enforcement, uh, was worried that uh, encryption, if it proliferated, and they used the same language used to talk about nuclear weapons when they talked about encryption technology, that if encryption proliferated, it would shut down law enforcement's ability to do things like wiretaps. And um, th this uh, manifested itself in all sorts of ways that were very, very harmful to our security. We're kind of still paying the price for them now. Uh, in particular, the U official U.S. government policy was to discourage the use of encryption in the private sector. And there was no actual direct law saying you can't use encryption, but what they did was a kind of interesting backdoor around that, which was uh, if you built a product using encryption, you couldn't export it without an export license that they basically wouldn't give you if your encryption was strong. And so that ended up being a de facto um, control on domestic use of encryption um, because, you know, nobody wants to build a product that you could only sell in, in one country, even if it's a large country like the U.S., um, and so this made kind of everybody unhappy, and uh, uh, in particular, it was happened at a really terrible time because the early 1990s were basically when we built all of the standards and all of the infrastructure uh, that we're now using today for things like the web and for uh, almost every part of our infrastructure. All of the standards and all of the um, basic platform assumptions can be traced pretty directly back to that era. And in that era, adding encryption to something was not something you would just do naturally because of course you would do that. Uh, it was something you really had to think about because it had all of these implications about exports. And so we ended up having things like, you know, the cryptography option and you could turn crypto off or downgrade to weak cryptography. And if you look at attacks that have been found in systems that use cryptography, it's very rare that it's the algorithms that are, uh, at at fault, but rather you do things like downgrade into the non-encrypted option. And we're still paying the price for that today. So in 1993, the government proposed a new crypto system to resolve this. And it 
it was unbelievably terrible in almost every aspect of its assumptions. Um, it used a new cipher, um, or new publicly new cipher, that NSA had apparently had sitting around for uh, a decade or two, uh, called Skipjack. And this had an 80-bit key, much better than 56 bits. Um, so that was probably, you know, that would probably be good enough to get us to roughly, you know, around now. Um, so, you know, a couple decades worth of, uh, of resistance to exhaustive search. That's great. And then it just went off the rails. It's a, uh, first of all, could, they wouldn't tell you what the cipher was. It was classified. It was classified at the secret level. So you could only get it in tamper resistant hardware which means that the cost of including encryption in something included buying special purpose hardware uh, in this chip called the Clipper chip. And that wasn't the worst part. Um, the worst part was that uh, this chip had an extra feature in it, which is that as part of the initialization vector string, uh, instead of being 64 bits long, it was actually 192 bits long, and the, in these extra 128 bits, it would embed an encrypted copy of the session key, uh, uh, encrypted with keys that would be held by the government, so that if they wanted to decrypt your traffic, they would just intercept the initialization vector, and then um, uh, they could decrypt the session key and then decrypt the traffic. And that naturally made everybody really happy, um, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, because the, uh, you know, all you have to do is completely trust the United States government um, and not, not just trust them to, um, uh, not just trust them to have honest intentions, but to trust them to actually safeguard these keys. And we all know that data breaches never happen on a, any kind of a large scale. Um, so, you know, it, it, whether you trusted the intentions of the U.S. government or not, you also had to trust the ability of the government to maintain a secret database of these keys. It was, it was just a horrible mess from a policy point of view. But to the government's great credit, none of this was hidden. None of this was done surreptitiously. They were out in the open about this. And AT&T, um, the part of AT&T I didn't work for, um, uh, uh, the part of AT&T that tried to make money rather than spend money, saw this as an opportunity uh, to build a product around this. And they built a device called the AT&T Telephone Security Device Model 3600, um, which, you know, AT&T was great at marketing names. Um, and it, this was essentially a civilian version of the Stu 3 encrypted telephone. It was actually made by the same people who made the Stu 3 at AT&T. And uh, it would incorporate the Clipper chip, um, this, this, this key escrow chip. And AT&T, you know, said, we want to be first. We want to, we want to be ahead of the curve on this. And they were so far ahead of the curve that they were actually the only company that built a product around this uh, device. Uh, and they, they kind of hurried this out to market. And as a result of AT&T's involvement and things like that, NSA, uh, who designed uh, the system, uh, came up to AT&T research, AT&T labs, to give a presentation on it. And so I naturally said, oh, I want to make sure to be at that. I'm, I'm really interested in this. And, um, the, you know, so they described how it worked. And, you know, casually at the end of the meeting, you know, uh, I, I went up to one of them and I said, yeah, you know, if there's any way to get a sample of this, I'd love to, you know, get, get one thinking they're just going to blow me off. And they said, sure, come down to Fort Meade. And uh, um, so I showed up a couple weeks later at Fort Meade and uh, spent the day in a, in a secure room with them. Uh, lights would go off and flash any time I would walk in the room. And unclean visitor in the room, you know, hide all your good stuff. Um, and people would be erasing their whiteboards. And then I walked out with a couple of, uh, of PCM CIA card form factor uh, clipper chips uh, on it. Uh, and by the way, getting hardware out of the building at NSA um, it, uh, it isn't supposed to be that easy. And, you know, so they kind of realized this as I was leaving. Oh, you're going to have trouble getting that out the door. Here, stick it in this bag. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, I went back on my on my way to, to New Jersey with my, my clipper chips and, and, you know, thought, okay, how do you 
how do you use this? Uh, and so I said, well, well, first, let me see how this key escrow feature works. How does this, how does it enforce this? Uh, you know, could you defeat it? Could you use this better cipher without exposing yourself to the uh, law enforcement access feature? And uh, what I discovered was that the obvious ways, the most obvious ways to defeat this, not send it, didn't work. It had built-in safeguards that would check to see whether you were sending a valid um, field um, before it would uh, allow the um, receiving chip to uh, actually operate. But then I discovered, well, how does it actually do that? And I discovered basically the second most obvious way of doing this did actually defeat this. And that was to exhaustively search uh, on possible valid law enforcement access fields until you'd find one that matched the built-in checksum that's under this encrypted field because it was a little longer than 80 bits. And so basically with, with two to the 16th effort, you could find a forged leaf field that would be happily accepted by the person you're talking to um, and you'd be able to encrypt away, but it would actually be useless because it was just randomly generated for decrypting your, your traffic. And then at that point, you know, here I am, I discovered this thing. I'm a scientist type person and my natural idea is to, you know, publish a paper. Um, and so I, I wrote this paper up and I circulated it to some colleagues. And, uh, you know, eventually it made its way to the part of AT&T that made the product around this and that valued its relationship with the government. And they were, um, um, and they were, uh, less happy than uh, a, a lot of my other colleagues were, uh, you know, and they pointed out quite correctly, you know, that, uh, you know, if you publish this, we will cut you, um, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and to the great credit of research, Arno Penzias, the Nobel laureate who ran uh, AT&T uh, labs, uh, Bell Labs uh, research, uh, said, no, no. We're research, um, we're the research part of AT&T. Our job is to tell the truth. And uh, the, the, the truth serves us well. And he really meant that. That wasn't just rhetoric. That was what he was saying to the people in the company that were trying to, to stop um, publishing from happening. This is what the culture of, of this research lab was like in the early 1990s. And that stuck with me ever, ever since, that I wanted to make sure that no matter where my life took me, I wanted to make sure to have a job where fundamentally I could say my job is simply to tell the truth. And that's a great privilege and a great luxury if you can pull off having a job like that. Most jobs have other considerations in them too. But if you can have a job where your job is to tell the truth, um, you really have a strong responsibility to, to do that, to, to find out things and, 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 and speak the truth as you understand it. Uh, and many of us, uh, you know, not all of us, but many of us have that privilege. And I think uh, one of the things we need to remind ourselves of is that if we are privileged to do that, we ha also have a responsibility to do that. And um, uh, that's certainly uh, a way that uh, I've tried to guide my own career, and it's one of the reasons that I went from AT&T to a university at the time I did. So after landing at Penn, um, I um, uh, started to look at, uh, I, I tried to, to kind of look at non-internet security. And one of the things that I did kind of uh, just before I left AT&T, although it wasn't connected to my leaving AT&T, I should say, is I said, well, you know, this kind of place that I'm in, it's kind of burning down, what should I do? Well, let me look at other kinds of security and lessons for that. And I decided to look at mechanical locks. Now, in our community at this point, locks and lock picking and understanding how locks work is part of our, uh, an ingrained part of our culture. At the time, it wasn't as big a deal in our culture then. It wasn't something that was part of the sort of background of every, every hacker skill includes understanding and manipulating mechanical locks. And I was interested in a question of, is there a relationship between cryptography and mechanical security devices like locks? And I found that as soon as you start to look at mechanical locks in those terms, 
some really interesting things pop out of that. And one of them is that master keyed mechanical locks, which is the locks that um, are used to open uh, all the doors in a building where the janitor has a key that opens all the doors, you have a key that opens only your door. Um, what I found is that there is a, a, a privilege escalation attack against locks that's very efficient. You can think of the lock to your door as an oracle and with making, you know, a small number of test keys, um, basically quadratic trials in uh, linear in the number of pins, uh, you can convert the information about your key into the key that opens all the doors in the building. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Let me, you know, let me publish this. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, look, my last experience with publishing this, this sort of stuff was the NSA, and they actually had a really good sense of humor about the whole thing. Um, uh, so, you know, this is, this is nothing compared to, you know, to breaking a government encryption system. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let me publish this. And I didn't think much of it. And then I, like, immediately, the day that this got published, started getting hate mail from locksmiths. Um, and uh, it, it, saying basically, you know, you have ruined everything. Um, how dare you? Uh, this is going to uh, completely destroy security for everybody. Uh, so locksmiths turned out to have no sense of humor about this sort of thing. And we're very much like computer companies in the 90s, a, uh, a, a, a thing that will uh, uh, keep coming back uh, uh, over and over. Um, in 2005, I uh, looked at surveillance systems again with my, my grad students, uh, uh, Micah Scheer, Gaurav, uh, um, Gaurav Shah, uh, Sandy Clark, and we looked at uh, how do law enforcement wiretaps actually work? That is, what are the mechanics of tapping a telephone? And what we found was that there's in-band signaling in wiretaps, uh, which is to say there's an idle tone on a wiretap when, when your phone is being tapped. And if you put the idle tone on your um, on your phone line while you're talking at a lower level, um, it turns off a wiretap. And we discovered that by basically buying a bunch of wiretap systems that had been decommissioned on eBay and um, experimenting with them. And then we found that there are actual standards for how this works because they can interoperate with each other. Uh, and we basically found out a way of turning off law enforcement wiretaps. And so um, we published that. And um, <laughs> Um, what we discovered was that the FBI has more of a sense of humor than locksmiths do. Um, they were actually very adult about the whole thing, um, at least as far as we know. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, and I don't know if it still works. Um, and then in, in um, 2013, what, what I discovered was that I decided to look at um, more non-internet security and looked at the protocols used to encrypt the two-way radios used by the FBI and the Secret Service and so on. And we discovered, uh, you know, the, this is an example of this. These are basically more expensive versions of the walkie-talkies that everybody is uh, carrying around, and they can do AES encryption uh, on them, and they're used for, you know, uh, highly sensitive um, law enforcement and national security um, operations. And so uh, I got a bunch of these radios and kind of reverse engineered the standards called Project 25. And um, <clears throat> what we discovered was that there were all sorts of um, uh, subtle protocol errors um, that, you know, if as soon as you start looking for them, you find them. Um, you, you can do denial of service. You can do things like erase keys remotely. Um, we, you know, we found a number of ways that you can actually ping radios without any encryption keys, and they'll tell you their location because they have GPS built into them, uh, which is, you know, somewhat useful if you're worried about being surveilled by the, the, the government. You can kind of get the marauder's map of where all the watchers are. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the standard was just kind of a, a complete mess. And then, you know, actually wondered, you know, is anyone using these attacks? And then we discovered none of these attacks matter because about half of the encrypted transmissions that the government was using, at least in the cities that we sampled this in, were going out in the clear, even though clearly they were 
thought they were encrypted. They were like talking to someone where half the conversation would be encrypted and the other half wouldn't be. Um, so we discovered there were terrible usability flaws in these radios that completely um, dominated any of the clever attacks that you know we, we thought were clever attacks that were found. All you had to do was what Robert Morris, uh, the uh, Bob Morris uh, senior who was at NSA, uh, he gave a talk at crypto in uh, 1994 uh, in which he gave the NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis. And we were all very interested in what the NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis is. And everybody got out their pens and started taking, taking notes. And he said, rule one of cryptanalysis, first look for clear text. And in fact, uh, that, that works, as it turns out. Um, uh, and in fact, it even works uh, for the US government. As far as I know, uh, uh, the, these are, still have a problem. So one of the things that all of this stuff has in common is that the um, half of the difficult part, half of the interesting part, and half the important part wasn't finding these things out. They were pretty easy to discover using the standard toolkits of computer security and hacking and, and computer science. These were all, none of these are great intellectual achievements. Um, but uh, all of them required quite a bit of effort to actually have impact and to get fixed. And in fact, some of these things still aren't fixed. Um, half of the work is explaining it in ways that will explain why this is important, why this is worth worrying about, why um, should, uh, why is this worth fixing? Um, and uh, sometimes even the best of efforts won't do it. Um, in after uh, the clipper chip uh, work got published. Uh, I got invited for the first time to do something that I thought, wow, this is a, a great honor. Uh, I got invited to come down and testify in front of Congress at a hearing on this. And I, you know, I'm an, I'm trained as an engineer and, you know, as an engineer, your idea is, well, if you're, if you're right about something, you just explain it and then they'll fix it. Uh, and, and it turns out, that's not actually how it works in Washington. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, being right isn't, isn't sufficient. You have to kind of make people care. And it really took about um, six or seven years uh, for the U.S. posture on encryption to change from being hostile to being encouraging. Um, and uh, that's because, you know, people in, uh, in industry took the time, people in the crypto community took the time to explain why it's really critical that we include um, strong cryptography in our in our infrastructure. So knowing it isn't isn't enough. We have to actually learn how to explain it. So that brings me to a project that I've been working on for a little bit north of 15 years in one way or another, along with many very, very talented colleagues uh, uh, around uh, the world and in our community. And that's the computing systems that support our democracy itself, uh, the voting systems and election systems that we have. So I want to spend a little bit of time making the pitch for you that this is important to work on and what some of the parameters of this are and how the technical aspects of this interact with uh, the larger um, social and democratic institutions that they support. And these are intertwined in ways that uh, uh, really make this, I think, secure voting and high integrity elections in the, you know, 25 or 30 years that I've been working in, in security. This is by far, um, you know, without doubt, the hardest problem I've ever encountered. Um, so um, this has an interesting history. Um, elections in the U.S. Uh, at the beginning of, of our, our democracy were pretty non-technical. They basically involved people showing up at the town hall and raising their hands um, and voting. And there'd be kind of consensus in the room about who the winner of the local election was. And that's kind of how it worked. Um, that has the a couple of disadvantages. The most obvious in retrospect is that's not a secret ballot. And we kind of understand a secret ballot as being a fundamental requirement for elections. But that's something that only evolved over time as technology for secret ballots started to be implemented. 
we only later started to understand that this is actually a requirement for elections. Um, the reason we stopped using everyone show up and raise your hand is that it really scales very poorly as your country starts growing. And, um, you know, this may work for, you know, electing the mayor of your very small town, but it, it, um, stops, it starts being very cumbersome for any kind of larger thing and where the number of voters exceeds the number of people that fit in the room. Um, so voting mechanisms and voting technology have be started to become important very quickly uh, as the United States was growing, um, starting with the very simple technology of marking a paper ballot and putting it into a ballot box. Um, in the 20th century, um, really the um, mostly the second half of the 20th century, um, more mechanical and electronic voting mechanisms have started to uh, come into play. Um, Machine-counted um, machine ballots, um, uh, voting lever voting machines that you um, flip, flip a little lever and then pull a big lever and that opens the curtain and you hear a big kerchunk and casts your vote. Um, machine counted um, paper ballots that are read by an optical scanner. Um, punch card ballots in which a little hole is put through um, a, a ballot and those were pretty famous uh, after the uh, 2000 election. I have an example of uh, one right here. Uh, and then finally in the 21st century we started to see outright voting computers where you'd vote on a terminal. Um, and uh, you know one of the consequences of this is that our confidence in the validity and legitimacy of the outcome of the election now depends not just on, you know, did we all get to vote, but it also depends on the question of, is this technology that we voted with actually um, of high integrity? Should we trust the technology itself? As software people, our answer is almost certainly, huh, are you kidding? This is, this is made of software. Now let me just point out that some of the requirements that we now have for voting fundamentally contradict each other. Um, one is that we have a requirement for secrecy and we also have a requirement for transparency. We have a requirement that you, no one can find out how you voted. In fact, you shouldn't even be able to prove how you voted because that would enable someone to coerce you into voting a particular way. But on the other hand, you want to be able to be sure that your vote got counted and you want to really be sure that everybody's vote got counted. How do you do that? How do you meet both of those requirements at once? It sounds either hard or impossible. And another difficult problem is that most of the technology that we know how to do as computer scientists with things like cryptography are aimed at detecting irregularities. They don't actually fix irregularities. So one of the problems with elections is that it is virtually impossible. Um, the uh, ninth district in North Carolina this year is proving to be an interesting and very painful exception to do an election over. If you discover an irregularity, you can't just hold a new election. You have to just kind of do the best you can in general with the results that you have. So in fact, a technology that says, oh, this, this cryptographic hash doesn't match is almost worse than not having it because what do you do at that point? Um, and so one of the really hard problems is remedies for irregularities, not just detecting um, irregularities. Um, in the US, um, there are high stakes in elections. We care about who wins them. Uh, there's also a long history of various kinds of fraud, mostly in local races, not um, presidential races. Presidential races get all the attention, but you know, if, if you want to buy an office, it's uh, uh, historically, you know, mayor or sheriff or dog catcher are the offices that uh, have a lot of the shenanigans going uh, on. Um, 
We also now have, as we discovered after a recent presidential election, that the threat is not just people trying to steal an election because they personally want to win it or they have a particular candidate that they support, um, but is uh, state actors who might be satisfied with simply disrupting an election um, at, or casting doubt on the integrity of its outcome. And so we now have uh, essentially local county clerks up against you know, the FSB as, um, and, and that's, uh, not a particularly great, uh, situation. So, uh, voting in the United States is decentralized, but high, but also hierarchical in that the, um, federal government has a very limited role. Uh, it sets broad standards, uh, things like, you know, if you're a citizen, you're entitled to vote. Um, if you're above a certain age and so forth. Um, uh, but each state has the laws that govern the details of elections uh, within that state. Uh, in most states, elections are run by counties. Uh, there are about 3,000 counties in the United States, uh, which means there are actually well over 3,000 individual election administrators in the United States, all of whom have to basically you know, procure voting equipment and manage all the logistics of an election and report results uh, out um, on election day. And very often, uh, these same people have a different job um, the rest of the year. Um, so very often the IT department is, you know, also supporting the roads department. And the budget for managing elections is often competing with the budget for things like, uh, you know, fixing potholes and building fire stations. So if you ask, you know, which would you prefer, a new firehouse um, uh, or, you know, shiny new voting equipment, that's a pretty tough sell for the shiny new voting equipment uh, or for securing the um, voting uh, system that you've got, because that's the simple reality of how we, we, we fund these things. Um, we also have uh, probably the most complex elections in the world. Uh, and by complex, what I mean is the number of different races, the number of choices that voters have to make in the U.S. is larger than almost anywhere um, uh, else uh, on earth. Um, and we have, uh, and even an individual precinct, an individual polling place might have multiple ballots depending on where a voter lives or which party they're registered in. To give you an idea of the scale of this, there are about 117,000 physical polling places in the United States. Um, there were in uh, the 2016 election 138 million ballots cast. Um, um, some of them were cast by mail. Some of them were cast uh, ahead of the election. Um, and that basically leaves 82 million Americans who voted on in person on election day at a polling place. That's a pretty big logistical thing managed in a totally decentralized way. So uh, the 2000 general election was an interesting thing. Who recognizes this picture? Uh, this was the recount of the uh, 2000 general election. And this picture was on every newspaper and news, news report in the country. And it basically was, look how silly those people in Florida are. They're using this antiquated punch card technology. We need to get rid of that. And I'd like to look at that punch card technology because um, it's kind of interesting. This is an example of a voting machine of the type used in Florida, though this particular one was from, uh, I believe, uh, Michigan. Um, and uh, what you would do is take this little stylus. You'd put your card in the top of the machine, and you take this little stylus, and you'd punch a hole through um, where your um, uh, candidate was. And the ballot was very complicated. There was this thing called the butterfly ballot, where it was printed on both sides of this book. But that's one of the interesting things that would happen was that normally you'd punch a ballot, and you'll notice number hole number 68 is punched through. Um, there's basically a little piece of cardboard that was on the ballot uh, card that disappears after you punch a hole through it. Um, now, you know, I'll, I'll notice this is a totally mechanical device. The only electricity involved is for the light. Um, and so that you can see what you're doing. Um, but uh, this has an interesting property. That little piece of cardboard, because of, you know, conservation of matter, goes somewhere. Um, and uh, where does it go? Well, it goes right behind where the 
number 68 is in this particular case. And so what that means is that on a normal day, uh, everything's fine. But if an unusually large number of people turn out to vote, um, the cardboard starts to back up. And it becomes physically harder to um, vote for the most popular candidates. Because what eventually happens is that you're only able to kind of dimple the piece of cardboard and not actually remove it. And even though you're making a little mark there, when the card is read by machine, it won't actually show a vote in that position. And so this is really interesting because I, I think this is an example of a completely mechanical system with what you could argue is a buffer overflow in it. Um, <laughs> So um, what happened was that Congress, after the 2000 election, totally divided country, disagreement on who should have won, widespread agreement that we need to replace these antiquated voting systems. And so Congress passed something called the Help America Vote Act, which basically provided federal funding to switch to accessible voting technology. States could now buy new shiny voting equipment. The problem was that that new shiny voting equipment didn't actually exist at the time the funding to buy it um, was provided. And so in an industry kind of popped up out of nowhere to produce voting machines. Um, and the most popular is called the direct recording electronic voting machine, which is basically a touch screen computer that records your ballot selections in its internal memory. So in other words, we've now created voting systems based on software. Um, I will observe this is computerized voting and that it depends on software. And also I will make an observation that software sucks. Um, see all the other talks in this conference uh, for a reference. Um, so um, one question is, can we make voting systems secure out of hardware that we don't actually know how to secure, out of hardware and software that we don't know how to secure? And I will make a humble observation as a cryptographer, which is that cryptography doesn't actually help with most of this, because most of what cryptography can do is detect errors. It can't correct them. So this goes back to the problem that knowing that your election was tampered with is incredibly unsatisfying if you can't produce the correct outcome. Um, I'm not going to go over um, uh, all of the details of this. I will say that in theory, this should be a matter of looking for a line in the code that says, you know, votes for candidate equals votes for candidate plus one. And if that line is present, your voting system is probably good. If not, uh, then there's a problem. But in practice, it's much harder than that um, because it's dependent on the entire platform. And in fact, when we looked at um, uh, uh, voting systems uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I led a team in 2007. Uh, other teams looked at other uh, manufacturers. I looked at the system. My team looked at the system made by ESNS. Uh, what we basically discovered was that every single component of the ESNS system uh, had unbelievably terrible flaws in the software and hardware that would allow you, if you could touch any single component, you could compromise kind of the entire election in that county. And um, those results turned out to be typical. Anybody who looked at any vendor's voting system pretty much came to the same uh, pretty much came to the same uh, result. Every current voting system that's been examined critically has turned out to be terrible. So what can we do about this? And I'm now going to go back to the citizen hacker aspect of this. So one of my, I think the, my proudest achievement was my participation in getting an exemption passed uh, uh, about four years ago to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, everybody's least favorite law. Um, this is the law that basically makes it illegal to publish vulnerabilities and look for vulnerabilities in systems that protect intellectual property, which is almost everything. Well, we managed to get an exemption to this that allows for good faith testing of consumer products for security flaws. And this is defined sufficiently broadly that it includes voting machines because consumers use voting <laughs> machines. Um, and uh, that's kind of a stretch, but they specifically said this definitely includes voting machines. And this was actually just renewed. It has to be renewed every three years. And if the effect is it makes it now legal 
illegal for anyone, not just the people who got the exemption, to go out and um, uh, get voting machines and look for weaknesses in them and publish them. And in fact, every year at DEF CON, we now uh, have a thing called the Voting Machine Hacking Village, where we get a bunch of voting machines and invite people over the weekend to come in and do their worst with them and replicate some of the attacks that have been found and find new ones. And you know, essentially what we find is that, wow, we weren't that smart because other people, the things we took weeks to find, other people are able to replicate in like three hours. Um, so, um, you know, what should we do is now the question as citizen hackers. So um, the internet is almost unanimous if you ask random people on the internet. The solution is either no software should be anywhere near elections, you should hand count everything, or more software should be used in elections. Um, that is, you know, things like vote on the blockchain. So I'd like to, to look at both of those extremes. The no software sounds kind of, you know, I was originally in that camp when I first started thinking about this, and I know how software is, uh, and I'm thinking I don't want software anywhere near elections any more than I want software near my, you know, my surgery or something like that. Um, but unfortunately, US elections are really complex, and computers, um, actually solve problems in um, vote counting and vote tallying and ballot creation that election officials actually have. And one of the most daunting of these problems is accessibility of the ballot. Not everybody can ha read or hand mark a paper ballot, and those people are as entitled to vote as you are. Um, and so how do we um, complicate, how do we accommodate very, very complex elections, voters who speak multiple languages and have different physical capabilities um, and so on? Computers have a role here and it, you know, saying that computers shouldn't have any role is not actually a practical solution. Uh, the more software solution is use the blockchain. Um, you know, and it sounds almost perfect. It's an immutable, decentralized ledger. But in fact, it doesn't actually solve any problems that elections have, but it makes a lot of them worse. Um, elections, it turns out, are not decentralized consensus uh, um, exercises, even though they sound like it. Um, in fact, elections have officials who are empowered to declare who the winner is and are empowered to run the election itself. Um, a blockchain doesn't actually help solve that problem when you have a single authority whose job is to basically decide uh, this is who the winner was and who operates the election um, itself. Um, and every blockchain-based system that's been proposed has, has had the property of both having terrible security problems and not actually solving any problems. So please just stop with this. Um, so uh, the probably the most important document that comes out and that I'll, um, that I'll um, uh, urge you to, to look at is the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine produced a consensus report last year called Securing the Vote. It is a remarkable document. It's just a little over 100 pages of a overview of how voting works, what the problems are, and recommendations of solutions. And it is really one of the first things to convert the problem of voting into a real engineering discipline. Um, and and I, if you're interested in this, I have two big recommendations. First, read the National Academies report. You can download it for free on the internet. Um, you, uh, the um, if you Google securing the vote, National Academies, you'll find it uh, uh, quite quickly. It is well worth your time if you're even remotely interested in this. And if you sat through this talk, you should be remotely interested in this. Uh, you've already spent, uh, you've already invested time. That's a sunk cost. We all know after a sunk cost, you should uh, continue on, right? That's the only way to go. Uh, at least that's how Bitcoin works. Um, the, uh, um, the, uh, um, the second is become a poll worker. Um, almost everywhere needs people to help on election day and that will teach you how elections work on the ground and get you relationships with the people who run um, elections in your county and who could really use your InfoSec expertise. Um, 
there have been two real important advances in the um, engineering of elections. One is uh, due to um, uh, Rivest and Wack, the same Rivest who's the R in RSA. Uh, he came up with this concept. It's badly named. Um, it sounds like it means something other than it means, but it's a really important idea. So this, the, yeah, you can use software in elections, but your election system should architecturally be designed to be software independent. And what does software independent mean? Well, it means a voting system is software independent if an undetected change or error in the software can't cause an undetectable change or error in the election outcome. Now, it sounds like if you think about that requirement, it sounds like that's just the same as saying don't use software. And that leads us to the second important um, contribution of elections, which is a, due to uh, Phil Stark at Berkeley, a statistician, who came up with a scheme called risk-limiting audits. And the idea of a risk-limiting audit is it's a statistically rigorous method of sampling um, precinct counted optical scan ballots, which are counted by computer, in a way that allows you to sample a small number of them, verify that they were counted correctly, and give you calculable confidence that the correct outcome of the election has actually been reported. And if you find discrepancies, you have to count more of the ballots until ultimately if the software was failed, you end up hand counting all of them. But if the software was working with a small amount of sampling, you can, um, uh, you can, uh, uh, only do a small amount of sampling and, and take advantage of computers for doing uh, the majority of the tallying. It's a huge advance because you can use existing equipment, optical scan paper ballot readers in the precinct in order to achieve this. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, we have the answer, but having the answer is only part of it. Uh, it's the easy part. Um, the hard part is now we have to actually get our elections more secure. And, uh, you know, the National Academies report carries real weight. That was a, a very helpful thing. But there are over 3,000 counties in the United States. There are about 5,000 individual election administrators. All of them need to understand the risks of this. Also, there's more to the elections than just the voting machines. There's back-end infrastructure for managing voter registration databases. That was actually targeted by foreign adversaries in 2016. The Mueller report actually talks about successful penetration of some of these systems. Um, in other words, those 3,000, 5,000 counties, they need our help. Uh, please help them. So thanks very much. Right. I think I... I think I have about 45 seconds for questions. Okay. Okay, great. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. What about Estonia? Estonia is a different country than the US. They, it's a parliamentary <laughs> democracy. Um, Estonia is a land of many contrasts. Uh, the, uh, so Estonia is, uh, uses online voting. They also have in-person voting. Um, the, um, they've had interesting successes with it. There's also been questions raised about the security of their system. Their elections are much simpler than those in the United States. Okay, thanks very much.